Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, I am a very spoiled child, so I recently got the chance to chat with photographer Andrew Feiler, who has a new book out titled A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 Schools That Changed America. And I have actually been wanting to talk about the Rosenwald schools for a while, so I was very excited about Andrew's book, particularly because it is as beautiful as it is moving and informative. Yeah, I think you started talking about wanting to do uh, an episode on them way back when we did the Sears History interview. Yeah. That was years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and we had uh, Jerry Hancock on. I wanted to do it, but I never felt like I had, like, the right entry point. And then Andrew's book happened and made it easy. Well, and this is not Andrew's first book. His previous book also has a historical theme. It's titled, Without Regard to Sex, Race, or Color, The Past, Present, and Future of One Historically Black College. This new book has also become an exhibit at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta, and it will tour after it finishes there at the end of this year. Yeah, we'll talk about that a bit during the interview. So let's jump right into that, where Andrew shares how he ended up a photographer, and specifically a photographer documenting and writing about history. First of all, Andrew, thank you so much for being with us. Great to be with you. Thank you for having me. What a delight for me. I feel so spoiled. Um, The primary reason you're here today is so we could talk about your latest book, but this is not your first book. So To do the runway to it, (laughs) I want to make sure we talk about your first book, which was Without Regard to Sex, Race, or Color, The Past, Present, and Future of One Historically Black College. And that covers the history of Morris Brown. So before we get into the newest, um, I would like for you to tell us your story, how you started pursuing a career in photography, and how you ended up focusing your lens on the subjects you have, particularly history and particularly black history. So in 2008, I started down a path that was four and a half very difficult years. I had taken over a family real estate business in 2002 when my dad had gotten sick. 2008, we went away for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. I had another business partner in the business. We got back, and the next day, my business partner died. 13 days later, my brother was diagnosed with a truly life threatening bone cancer. Uh, Mercifully, he has Uh, He is now 13 years cancer-free, but that was not a given at the time. Soon after that, my father's health completely collapsed. And then the real estate world imploded in the Great Recession, and I spent three years and four months doing real estate workouts. And collectively, those are the types of experiences that cause you to say, what do you want to do the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. And so um, I started down the path in the midst of this uh, period of of my life. I've been a serious photographer most of my life, but I started on this path of taking my work more seriously and mercifully getting taken more seriously. And one of the things that you have to do in in, in that process is figure out what is your voice as a photographer? Mm -hmm. What is your voice as an artist? Well, I've been a civic activist my entire life as well. I've founded more than a dozen civic initiatives. I serve on a number of boards of not-for-profits. I have been an active advisor Uh, for many years to a number of elected officials and political candidates. And what I found is I really, as I started to explore this, uh, my photography more diligently, is that my photographic voice was my civic voice. And I was working on a body of work on abandoned public school spaces in the South, because an abandoned public school is a story of demographics, white flight, gentrification, Mm -hmm. when Morris Brown College filed for bankruptcy. And so I thought, you know, this is a really important story. It has race. It's an historically black college. It has religion. The Morris Brown College was founded under the auspices of the AME Church. It has class because it was a college that had become one that was primarily focused on the children of families of lesser means. And that story, that multi-layered story, becomes my first book. Uh, But it was also uh, what my process is to read and shoot and shoot and read, and the reading informs the shooting, and the shooting informs the reading. And there was two th- moments that really shaped that project. 
One was when I came across the statistic that there were originally about 120 historically black colleges in America. We were down to about 100. Those 100 colleges are 3% of colleges in America. They are more than 10% of African Americans who go to college, more than 25% of African Americans who earn degrees. And that replants this story in the midst of this central question we have in our culture today. What is our, how do we create on-ramps to the American middle classes? And I studied that question. I realized I stumbled on this much broader American narrative. Education has been the backbone of the American dream since before there was the United States of America. The first taxpayer-funded school is founded in Dedham, Massachusetts in 1644. The Land-Grant College Act, which creates colleges all across America, is created in 1862, historically black colleges in the decades after the Civil War. Rosenwald schools in the early decades of the 20th century. The education provisions of the GI Bill transform America from relatively poor to relatively prosperous. Brown versus Board of Education is one of the highlights of the civil rights movement. And what are we talking about today? Crushing levels of student debt, college affordability, college access. This more than 375-year narrative arc uh, if the, that drives American history is a tradition at risk. And that became the message in this first book. And then how did the Rosenwald schools get on your radar? So I had just turned in my first book to my publisher. Um, it was This was early 2015. That book comes out at the end of 2015. And in February of 2015, I found myself at lunch with a woman named Jeannie Syriac. And Jeannie had originated the role of African-American heritage specialist at the Georgia State Historic Preservation Office. And she's the first person to tell me about Rosenwald schools. And I was shocked. I am a fifth-generation Jewish Georgian. I have been a progressive activist my entire life. The pillars of this story, Southern, Jewish, progressive activist are the pillars of my life. How could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? So I come home and I Google Rosenwald schools and I find that there's a couple of academic books on the topic, but there was no comprehensive photographic account of this story. And I set out to do exactly that. So for our listeners to lay the groundwork, will you tell us just about the Rosenwald schools and what their purpose was and how they got set up? So Julius Rosenwald is born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution in Germany. He grows up in Springfield, Illinois, across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. He rises to become the president of Sears, Roebuck & Company, and with innovations like satisfaction guaranteed or your money back, he turns Sears into the world's largest retailer of its era. And he becomes one of the earliest and greatest philanthropists in American history, and his cause is what later becomes known as civil rights. Booker T. Washington, born into slavery in Virginia, goes to Hampton College in Virginia, becomes an educator, and is the founding principal of the historically black college in Alabama known then as Tuskegee Institute. And the two men meet in 1911. What you have to remember is that 1911 is before the Great Migration, which doesn't begin until later that decade. So 90% of African Americans live in the South. And public schools for African Americans are mostly shacks with a small fraction of the funding provided to the education of white children. Many jurisdictions do not even have public schools for African Americans. And Booker T. Washington asks Julius Rosenwald to join the board of Tuskegee, and later in 1911, he agrees, but the two men keep talking. What can we do together? And they focus on this idea of public schools for African Americans. And the geni there's genius in this program. They reach out to the black communities of the South, and they say, we want you to be a full partner in your progress. So you must contribute to a school. If you will contribute to a school and we will count as your contribution cash, land, materials, or labor. And if you will reach out to the school board, the white school board, because we want to create deliberate black-white dialogue as a foundation for future progress. And these have to be public schools. So the white school board, we welcome their contributions. But what they have to do is agree to own, maintain, and staff the school, pay for the teachers. You do those things. And Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution to school construction. And from 1912 to 1937, this program builds 4,978 schools across 15 southern and border states, and the result is transformative. One thing that's interesting, uh, in case people do not know the timeline of 
uh, Booker T. Washington's life, he died not that long after the the two men met, like less than four years after they met. But still, he was very clearly influential on it, uh, on this whole project. Can you talk about how Julius Rosenwald continued kind of the dialogue after his partner in this project was no longer there? Yeah, so Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington shared two important values. Julius Rosenwald was deeply committed to America because he saw America as a safe haven from anti-Semitism. And he saw that America weakened by its treatment of African Americans. Booker T. Washington, of course, was dedicated to the uplift of African Americans. And they also shared a commitment to self-help. And it was Booker T. Washington who understood that education was the path forward and that what was missing in the panoply of education was small schoolhouses. Small because everybody – there were not buses for these schoolhouses and they had to be able to walk to these schools. And so many of these schools – most of these schools, particularly in the early years of the program, were very small. And so they create this program together, but it's enormously successful. And Julius Rosenwald commits to continuing the program even after the death of Booker T. Washington, his partner in this venture. It's important to note that the relationship between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington is one of the earliest collaborations between Jews and African Americans. And there is a direct connection between their collaboration, their friendship, and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel walking with Dr. King, who famously says of that experience of walking with Dr. King that it felt like his feet were praying. And what happened in Georgia earlier this year, when Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff crisscrossed this state together yeah. for two months and clearly built not just a political alliance but a deep personal friendship, that relationship in which Georgia sends its first African-American senator, its first Jewish senator to the United States Senate, that relationship between John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock stands on the shoulders of the relationship, the friendship between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. You are, as you said, a, a photographer, but this book has a lot of writing. Every photograph comes with a story. Was that always your intention? It was not. Uh, that was actually new. And, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, I can't, what happened, so look, I knew this was an extraordinary story. The question is, how do you tell the story visually? And I started out with exterior images, one, two, three teacher schools, white, small, white clapboard buildings. To the end of the program, there's one, two, and three-story red brick buildings. But that story was incomplete because of the original 4,978 schools, there's about 500 left. Only half of those have been restored. And so many of these schools are at risk of collapse. There's an inherent component of this story, which is the plea for preservation. These spaces are the locus of history and memory. And so I needed to tell the adaptive reuse story and the preservation narrative. And suddenly I need, I need to get inside and suddenly I need permission. And once you need permission, you got to start talking to people. And that's <laughs> when I met these extraordinary people, former students, former teachers, his preservationists, historians that are trying to save these structures. And I end up telling their narratives through portraits. But in the course of meeting all these people and doing, as I said earlier, my process is to shoot and read and read and shoot and, and the reading informs the shooting and the shooting informs the reading. And I came across so many incredible stories that indeed I felt compelled to write a short story that goes with every image or in some cases pairs of images. I found Rosenwald schools connected to the Trail of Tears, to the Great Migration, to the Tuskegee syphilis study, to the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, to the litigation of Brown v. Board, embezzlement, murder. And those stories are told in the prose complement. So this is actually a hybrid body of work. It's both images and stories that go together. Did you ever anticipate that you were going to become a writer and historian in addition to this photography career that you had switched to? Well, it's interesting. Actually, I have an, I've had an interest in history my entire life. I took a, a, my undergraduate degree is actually in economics, but I, I took a lot of history classes in college. I actually have two graduate degrees. One's an MBA, but one is actually a, a modern history degree. And so the history component of it came naturally to me. 
but I certainly never expected to be writing 16,000 <laughs> words of stories. Um, but the, the stories are so extraordinary and so powerful that it, it, it was a joy to have that as part of this process. This book is one that right from the opening is very compelling. And one of the things that's so compelling is that there's an introduction by John Lewis, who, of course, being an Atlanta hero, um, aside from just his civil rights work, which is amazing in and of itself, being part of the fabric of Atlanta. I get choked up just talking about sure, it. Sure, absolutely. One of the few people I've ever met that I just burst into tears the second I met him. Um, will you talk about how that came to be, that you got to have him be part of this and that beautiful portrait that you made of him? Thank you. Um, it, so I have to – let me set a little bit of context. This program transforms America. There are two economists in the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. And what their data shows is that prior to World War I, there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South. And that gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement is Rosenwald schools. But the other major impact of this program is that many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the movement come through these schools. Maya Angelou. Medgar Evers, multiple members of the Little Rock Nine who integrate Little Rock Central High School, and Congressman John Lewis all attended Rosenwald schools. So Congressman Lewis is clearly the most prominent uh, alum of the Rosenwald schools program. Living at the time I was working on this project, uh, I grew up in Savannah. I left the South after high school and bouncing around the world for 15 years, decided it was finally safe to come back to the South. The South had grown up in my absence. So I came back. I, I had been – I was a constituent of Congressman Lewis's for 25 years. I lived in the 5th Congressional District the entire time I've been in Atlanta. And so I reached out to Congressman Lewis and I asked him if he would contribute an introduction to this book. And he said, you know, I'm not sure I'm comfortable writing the history of Rosenwald schools. I just know I went to school there. I said, Congressman Lewis, there are three other essays in this book. One by Jeannie Syriac at the State Historic Preservation Office, one by Brent Leggs, who heads up the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is focused on African American preservation. One by me. We've got the history covered. What I want you to do is what only you can do. Bring us into that classroom. What was it like to go to school there? What role did education play in your life? And he said, oh, I can do that. <laughs> And so I met with Congressman Lewis in his office, this round table in the center of his office, and sat there for several hours with him as we refined the introduction. This was October 29th of 2019. And I had gotten into his – staff had let me into his office in advance and had set up my lights. And at the end of this session, uh, he put on his jacket for me to take his portrait and there's this – cancer awareness ribbon on his lapel. And he said, should I take this off? I said, Congressman Lewis, I want the authentic you, and that is the authentic you. I'll leave it on. And it was exactly 60 days later that he went public with his cancer diagnosis. So his contribution to the forward to this book is one of the last public acts that Congressman Lewis uh, contributed. And he also praises your work in it, so that's got to feel pretty amazing. You know, he's an extraordinary person. And it was one of the great sort of side you – know, I didn't start this project to have the opportunity to spend an afternoon with Congressman Lewis in his office sharing our experiences. Um, what an extraordinary gift from my artistic journey to have shared this experience with Congressman Lewis. Amazing. Um, that might be the answer, but I'm curious, what was the most – unexpected or surprising aspect of working on this project. You took a lot of journeys and met a lot of people and uh, saw a lot of things that you probably didn't anticipate. Yeah, I did. So I, 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 this project took me three and a half years. I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 of the program states. And, and I think there were two things that really jump out at me to answer your question. One of them is I, I've been a fan of audiobooks for a long time. And as I was on – I did those 25,000 miles almost entirely by myself and I listened to audiobooks as I was driving across the South. And I listened to civil rights history. I listened to the entire Taylor Branch trilogy on the civil rights movement. I listened to an entire book on Letter from Birmingham Jail 
I listened to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's book on the Harlem Renaissance. Two of the people whose portraits I shot in this book uh, have memoirs. I listened to their – they were on audiobook. I listened to those memoirs. And what an extraordinary compliment to this journey to be out in the Mississippi Delta listening to civil rights history. So that was really a, a beautiful compliment to this entire story. The other was that throughout this journey, I continued to meet these extraordinary individuals who were former students, former teachers, the preservationists that are trying to save these schools in their community. And they were so warm and so welcoming and so excited about being part of this project, so excited that I was here to help share this history that they knew was important and they were concerned was going to be lost. And that embrace of this sort of broad Rosenwald School community was unexpected and an incredible joy. I want to talk for a second about the structure of the book because you break it out in terms of like the timeline, but that timeline is also connected to kind of expansion and growth of the program so that the footprint of it shifts uh, in different years. Well, do you talk about those three phases that you cover and and kind of just how this program went from its initial phase to becoming a much bigger, broader project? Yeah. So the initiative begins uh, in 1912 with a pilot of six schools all built close to Tuskegee where Booker T. Washington and his team can keep an eye on the program. And I'm going to digress here for a second to tell you one story that because it's, it's really an important component of, of how this story unfolds. Booker T. Washington has photographs made of the students and teachers standing in front of their schools, carrying the hopes and dreams of their communities, and he sends them to Julius Rosenwald, who writes back that he is so moved that he is committing to expand the program. Almost all of my work prior to this work has been in color. This body of work is entirely in black and white and horizontal in homage to those images of students and teachers standing in front of their schools who become, that this becomes part of the visual history and the visual language of this program. So the program is run out of Tuskegee starting in 1912. Booker T. Washington dies in 1915. The program continues to be run out of Tuskegee, but it's starting to explode. And it's reaching across more and more southern states. And it simply gets to a point where it has outstripped the ability of the team at Tuskegee to manage this. Meanwhile, Julius Rosenwald's philanthropy is becoming much more expansive. And so in the early years of this program, he's writing checks. But in 1917, he actually creates the Rosenwald Fund. And so in 1920, they actually open an office to manage the Rosenwald Schools program in Nashville. So that first phase, what I call the Tuskegee phase, is from 1912 to 1920 when the programs were run out of Tuskegee. Starting in 1920, it's now run out of Nashville, which, by the way, is why the archives of the Rosenwald Fund are at Fisk University. And it's in those years, it's run by a man named Samuel Smith, that they start moving from building schools to building model schools. And they create these plans that they make available for free to anybody who will use them. And so what, to be a Rosenwald school, you had to get Rosenwald funding. But there are thousands of schools built across America with these plans for both blacks and whites that aren't Rosenwald schools but are built with Rosenwald plans. And that's what I call the Nashville phase from 1920 to 1927. But in 1927, Julius Rosenwald says, you know, I'm getting older. We need to move this from my philanthropy to institutionalizing it a little bit more. And so he hires uh, Edwin Embry, who had been a senior executive at the Rockefeller Foundation, where Julius Rosenwald was on the board. And the program is now run out of Chicago, where Julius Rosenwald is resident. And the program pivots from focusing on building schools to focusing on educational outcomes. They create incentives for libraries in the schools. They create incentives for school buses and for in adding to the school year. The Rosenwald Schools Program formally ends in 1932 with the death of Julius Rosenwald. And the, the fund moves on to focus on other things. But in 1937, President Roosevelt calls up Edwin Embry at the fund and says, 
I'd like a Rosenwald school in Meriwether County, Georgia, near his home in Warm Springs. And Edwin Embry says back to President Roosevelt, well, you know, Mr. President, the program ended in 1932, but for you, we'll build another school. And the very last school is built in Meriwether County. And what happens is the school board agrees to make its contribution. The black community makes its contribution. The WPA makes a contribution. And the head of the WPA comes into the Oval Office to report to President Roosevelt. And he reports to President Roosevelt that they're $1,000 short on the funds they need to build this school. And Roosevelt, in the Oval Office, pulls out his checkbook and writes a $1,000 check to close the gap. And later that year, in 1937, he presides over the dedication ceremony of the Eleanor Roosevelt School in Warm Springs, Georgia, the last Rosenwald School, and that school still exists today. I love it. You mentioned earlier that there are not just pictures of the schools, but also a lot of portraits in this book. And you have portraits of people that are connected to these various schools. Some of them are students. They're, I know there's at least one teacher that's in there. Um, will you talk about some of those people and maybe a few of your favorite portraits to shoot? I'll describe two. So imagine you are inside a small, white clabbered one-teacher school, the K. Rose School in Sumner County, Tennessee. Over the doorway hangs a portrait of Julius Rosenwald, that has hung in that spot since that school opened in 1923. And under his watchful gaze stand two African-American men in their late 70s, Frank Brinkley and his brother, Charles Brinkley. Both of them attended the K. Rose School. Both of them went to college. Both of them went to graduate school. And both of them become educators. Frank becomes a high school math and science teacher. Charles becomes a middle school principal. They have four sisters, all of whom attended the Cairo School, all of whom attended college. And the six siblings together have 10 children. All 10 children went to college. That legacy may not have happened without this schoolhouse. Another photograph, which takes place inside the Hopewell School in Bastrop County, Texas. The building is in the final stages of restoration. The modeled walls are primer. You can see the plastic covering the floors while the, it's being painted. The, pot, the original potbelly stove is also wrapped in plastic. And Sophia and Elroy Williams, in their 80s, stand in this space holding up an enormous photograph in this beautiful gilt frame. The photograph is from the 19th century. It's of Sophia and Martin MacDonald. They were born into slavery. And upon emancipation, Martin McDonald starts raising farm animals. And he acquires some land. He acquires some more land. And eventually, he acquires 1,200 acres. And when the Rosenwald Schools program comes to Bastrop County, Texas in 1919, the family donates two acres of land for the school. Its first teacher is Sophia and Martin McDonald's daughter. One of her students is her daughter, Sophia Williams, who at this moment is standing on the left holding up this portrait of her grandparents, her husband, Elroy Williams, standing on the right holding up this portrait of her grandparents, attends a different Rosenwald school in Bastrop County. Both of them go to college, both come back to Bastrop County, have an entire career as educators, and are now in the final stages of the restoration of this school and turning it into a community center and museum. And I found this story time and time again. Students becoming teachers, becoming the keepers of the flame of history and memory in their communities. And I find that it was an inspiring uh, story to come across. As our listeners know, I so like a fiend. So, of course, when I saw the Pleasant Hill quilters, I was obsessed with that picture uh, because we see some of their work, but also that's another multi-generational photo of just these women who do these amazing projects related to the history of the schools. Will you talk about them a little bit? So, the Pleasant Hill quilters, this is six African-American women sitting and standing uh, together inside the Pleasant Hill School in Cass County, Texas, and in front of them is a quilt that's in the process of being formulated. These women, which includes 
several Rosenwald School former students, several people who have parents who went to Rosenwald schools, and one Rosenwald School former teacher quilted, sold quilts to raise the money to restore what was then the dilapidated Pleasant Hill School. They have turned it into a community center, and they meet on most Mondays to quilt in the school. And I will tell you that um, beside having spent an absolutely delightful afternoon interviewing them and doing this portrait, I commissioned them to make a quilt in a, in our home. I love it. Oh, treasure. Yeah, totally. It's it's magnificent. Amazing. You've kind of referenced this already, that some of these schools st- certainly still exist today. Some are historic, but some have been repurposed to be other things, like the Walnut Senior Center. Yes. Um, will you talk about those spaces and how they've evolved and they still exist in a historical sense, but they're also living, active spaces? So of the, as I said, they're, they're of the original 4,978 Rosenwald schools, about 500 survive. Only half of those have been restored. Very few are still in use for educational purposes. Most of them simply outgrew that use a long time ago because the vast majority of these structures are small one, two, three teacher schools. In fact, of the 105 schools that I went to, only five are still in use for educational purposes. So in order to preserve these schools, they had to have been adaptively reused. And that adaptive reuse process is an important part of the history, right? We just discussed the Pleasant Hill School. That's now a community center. Some of these schools are are church halls. Some of them are museums. Some of them are – there's one that's the offices of a truck rental company. There's one that's apartments. There are many uses, but that adaptive reuse process is an important part of how we do historic preservation in America. The problem, of course, is – that many of these schools are not restored. And in fact, I came across schools that had collapsed so recently that in one case they were surrounded. Uh, the school literally, I found out later, had been demolished a week before I got there because it had been deemed unsafe and it was surrounded by yellow caution tape. And there was another that had collapsed right before I got there and it was surrounded by emergency fencing with keep out signs. And that's what happens when we don't take the time to preserve the ability of these spaces to help share our history, help communicate our history, help bring us in touch with our history. I wonder as a photographer what your approach is, both just from your mindset as well as your lens of looking at one of these places that is still, you know, an active live place versus when you come across a pile of rubble you're documenting in some ways the same history for both of them, but they're obviously very different places. Yeah. How do you shift from one to the other, and what are you looking to capture that's different in one case versus the other? I'm looking for moments that have emotional content, that become the vector for bringing people into the, these experiences. I mean, eventually what this body of work is about is using photography to bring people into this hidden story in American history. So, for example, there are a number of schools that I found that were buildings that were falling apart. But the Hannah School in Newberry County, South Carolina, which looks quite distressed because it is, is surrounded by a graveyard. And it, in, in fact, and in the story, I tell, the, I add the detail that it stands on Dead Fall Road. You cannot make this stuff up, I love it. right? And so that becomes that becomes an important mechanism for for sharing this. I was in a number of these schools that have been converted into museums. But when I was in the Warfield School uh, in Tennessee, there's a picture of Abraham Lincoln on the wall with a light angling through these big, large nine over nine pane windows that are an important part of the Rosenwald School architecture. So this pattern of this light from these infamous windows complementing the picture of Abraham Lincoln on the wall, that becomes a moment. I was in the uh, Elmore County Trading School in Wetumpka, Alabama, and they have a black history display. It's fascinating what choices somebody makes Mm -hmm. when when they are communicating black history, right? In this case, it's Thurgood Marshall, Nelson Mandela, Barack Obama, Harriet Tubman, 
those choices are so interesting that that was a, that was a photograph that I took as well and that's included in this book. So I think that's what I'm looking for, whether it is a deteriorating structure or a vibrantly restored community center, there are visual moments that you can capture that help bring people into the story and connect them to the emotional threads of the story. As you said, 25,000 miles and a lot of years and a lot of time and a lot of conversations. What was your biggest personal takeaway from the project? Like, how were you changed when this was sent off to printer? When you read the history of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, you are struck by their pragmatism. And it's caused me to think about what is pragmatism? And what I concluded was that there's two elements that were really important in the work of these men. They are building schools for African Americans in 1912 in the Jim Crow South. That is a deeply optimistic act. And on top of that, that is a multi-generational act. They knew that it would take generations for that work to pay off. They were playing long ball. And that combination of optimism and long-term thinking, that is their pragmatism. And to me, that's their gift to generations of African Americans, their gift to American history. That was my biggest takeaway, that combination of be optimistic, think long-term, and in the immortal words of John Lewis, make good trouble. This is a, a really cool project because it is not only a book that people can buy wherever books are sold, but it is also an exhibit. Um, will you tell us about the exhibit at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights? So the work of my first book traveled over four and a half years to nine different museums. And I knew that the idea of photographic prints were yet another way to bring people into this story. And I was about halfway through shooting this work when I sat down with the director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights here in Atlanta. And I showed this work and the reaction was like immediate. It was like, we are going to do this exhibition. <laughs> I was kind of like, okay. <laughs> um, and they have been an extraordinary partner. There are We made the decision to print these images large. The images are 20 inches by 30 inches, which photographically is an enormous print. There's 85 photographs in the book. 23 of them are in the exhibition. These stories, as we've discussed, are so integral to this body of work that the story sits underneath each of the images in the exhibition. The exhibition opened, um, opened in May. It will be up through the end of this year. Uh, and then the exhibition travels and will go to – uh, first to the Charlotte Museum of History, then the National Civil Rights Museum of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, the Tennessee State Museum in Nashville, the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience in New Orleans, uh, and then to the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And that gets you through to the end of 2024. And I'm just starting to schedule my first exhibitions in 2025. It'll continue to travel. And by then there'll be another book and you can just start the whole process over. That that would be the plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really was so struck by just how beautiful these photographs are. Thank you. The way you use light to tell a story does some stuff to my mind and soul. So thank you for that. And thank you for spending all this time with me today. And it's it's been a joy. I appreciate uh, your in I look, I I think Think, look at where we are today as a culture. We are at this extraordinary moment where we understand the imperative of telling a diverse American narrative, a complete American narrative, an accurate American narrative. And I see my book and this project part of this effort to diversify how we tell a more inclusive American story and your podcast is also part of this important effort to tell an inclusive American story. Uh, this was a particularly thrilling interview, not only because I love the subject matter, but also because this was the first time I returned to our office and our studios 
since the pandemic began. So it was such great fun to have this wonderful conversation with Andrew Filer, and I am so thankful for his time. The book, once again, is A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 Schools That Changed America. You can find it anywhere books are sold. And if you'd like to learn more about the exhibit at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, you can visit civilandhumanrights.org. You can also find out more about that and about Andrew at andrewfiler.com, and his last name is spelled F-E-I-L-E-R. Uh, we hope you check it out because he's a fascinating person, and truly, like, I am not blowing smoke when I say he's a very gifted photographer. Um, he does some really, really beautiful stuff, and the photos in this book are spectacularly beautiful. That a uh, portrait of John Lewis he talked about that I got choked up while we were talking is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and I love that there's that perspective included in the book about what it was like to attend one of these schools. And you really see like how that impacted the role of education in America, the world of American Black students, and just like I, it really did change everything. So it's, I love it. I love it. Um, I hope you check it out because you too will love it. It's a lot of good stuff. Um, I have fun foodie email, which I feel oh, like good. is what I always talk about at this point, but I'm really enjoying everybody's stories of their cooking disasters and triumphs. This one is from our listener, Anna. I, I don't know if it's Anna or Anna, so my uh, apologies if I get it wrong. But uh, Anna writes, I hope you're both doing well. You've had a string of really great episodes recently, all on topics that are personally fascinating to me. I finished your episode on Debre Coconaria last week, and I loved it so much. I shared it with a fellow foodie friend who was my neighbor when I lived in Rome. She reminded me about the first time I ever had my recently become husband's family over to dinner at our house. Obviously, for an Italian family, food and cooking is super important, and I knew I had to get it right. I spent over a month studying recipes for the perfect lasagna, and I got it down to a fine art. My friend asked me what I was planning on cooking them, and I told her she was absolutely horrified. She begged me to choose something else, explaining that every region in Italy does lasagna in a slightly different way, and if I got it even slightly wrong, I would risk spending the evening having all my hard work compared to the family recipe from their nonna, and it would feel like a disaster even if it was really good. This was especially important for my husband's family as they actually come from the region that invented lasagna in the first place. Unfortunately, that conversation was about two hours before they arrived. I flew into a complete panic and went into the dinner absolutely petrified, but it turned out that my hard work paid off. My mother-in-law still talks about my lasagna recipe, and I think that dinner is what persuaded her to allow her son to marry me. It turns out English people can cook after all. My friend and I laughed all over again at this story after she listened to your episode, so I thought I'd share. Keep up all the good work getting us all through these long pandemic months, years, decades. I've lost track. Hope you're both doing well. All the best. Uh, I love this. I love a I love a cooking triumph story, that's for sure. <laughs> I feel like um, I would be the cooking fail. I would mess it up. But I also wanted to mention, in relation to that, uh, we got uh, an email from our listener, Darlene, and a couple other people have reached out to me to ask about the meatloaf recipe. The meatloaf recipe is online. It's on our social media. If you check out our Instagram or our Twitter, there it is. Uh, and that is the one that we mentioned in another listener mail and got permission to share the famous secret, but not really that secret, Lipton soup ingredient recipe uh, for meatloaf. And I will tell you, I may have sent my husband out to purchase all of the ingredients <laughs> this morning. So uh, by the time this episode airs, I will have either succeeded or failed in recreating it. Either way, I'll eat the evidence. <laughs> yeah, we've heard from uh, several listeners in the comments, particularly on Instagram and Facebook that the recipe is very similar to their own family recipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's a little um, different from some that I've done. There's a, I had never done it. Um, the one that my mother passed down did not include that whole, like, cooking the bread and milk before you incorporate it into the meat, mm -hmm. which is an interesting part of it for me. But um, hopefully by the end of today, I will be um, very full and happy with a contented smile on my face and full of meatloaf. So 
up. Also, Anna, if you want to send that lasagna recipe on over, I'm ready to receive, and I will broadcast if you say it's okay. <laughs> we could just become like a sideline business of historical recipes. Um, I love, as I've said before, people sharing those and making it so other people can join their own histories with theirs and make something new and delicious and nurture all of us together. I thank you so much to everyone who's written us about their their cooking efforts. I love that so much. Uh, you can write to us too. We are at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History, including that yummy recipe. And if you would like to subscribe to the show and you haven't gotten around to it yet, it's super easy and will take you no time. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app at Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.